Good afternoon. I'd like to call the Finance Committee meeting to order, please. And someone looking somewhat similar to Ms. Whitworth is here. I know. Can y'all believe it? Is that you? It? That would be me. Okay. That would be me. Can you believe it? It's already August. We're just a year gone. Right. And we're getting ready to start this ride back up again. <laughs> All right. Um, today I'll be presenting the amended FY23 budget recommendation and the FY24 recommendation. Um, at the governor's request, he has requested that the amended 23 budgets be held flat for all state agencies. So you will not see any adjustments in our FY23 budget recommendation. So the excise, as you can see here, is a little bit over $2 billion. Our transportation trust funds, we're at $150 million. Um, the transit trust fund, better known as the ride share fee, the 50 cents that are received on those um, is 15.9 million. There was 36.9 million in state general funds that were in our budget. And then you see a small amount of 351,000 that was for Greta that's redirected out of our budget because that appears in the Department of Community Affairs budget. So that's why it's not for reflected here. Um, all of this right here on the bar graph is just a little refresher for everyone that in the 23 amended budget, Roughly 48% um, went toward the capital programs. That's capital construction, capital maintenance, and local roads administration. Um, there's 11% that went toward general operations. Um, general operations is primarily made up of the admin components, uh, program delivery, um, data collections, the planning office, traffic management. Um, LAMIG, that is the 10% of excise calculation. Um, routine maintenance, which is our second largest um, program that we have, is roughly $461 million, and that makes up 21% of the overall budget. CERTA makes up roughly 2%, and that's made up of debt service and the GTIB. Um, intermodal is consists of airport aid, transit, rail, ports, and waterways. Um, and it makes up roughly 2%. The geo bond debt service is roughly 5%. And then finally, you have payments to the ATL, which is around 1% of the overall budget. Y'all may recall that it was transferred and administratively attached to us, just like CERTA is administratively attached to us. What is that? What is that primarily used for? That's their operations. Operations? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's their operations. Okay, so that is the 23 budget. It's remained flat. There's no additions or reductions. Um, moving into the 24 revenue comparison, um, we're bringing in and amending in $85.4 million into our fiscal year 24 budget. Roughly, there's an increase of $24 million that is going into the excise to bring it to $2 billion. Um, there's an additional $61 point three million dollars that's being brought into the budget through the transportation trust fund which is um, primarily made up of the hotel motel fees um, highway the heavy um, vehicle fees electric vehicle fees that that was the main component there to bring it to 212 million dollars and that number is based off of the FY22 collections so they're in a two-year lag um, in the transit trust fund the rideshare fees they have remained flat for 24 thus far. State general funds have remained the same as 36.9 million. And then you see that transfer that I just was talking about for Greta. To bring the overall budget recommendation for 24 to just a little bit under $2.3 billion. Um, the next slide is the bar chart. Uh, Mr. Lewis, member previously, in some years past, you talked about the capital programs, but we're almost there. It almost makes up 50% of the overall uh, budget that we have at 49%. Um, general operations makes up 11% of the budget. Um, LAMIG, truing up the excises at 10%. Uh, routine maintenance is still our second largest, bringing that program to $481 million, which is 21% of the overall budget. Um, the payments to CERTA category is $44 million. It's gone down some. For, so from in 23 was at 2%. It's roughly 1% of the overall budget due to some debt service reductions in that program. 
Um, intermodal is roughly still staying at 2%, at the 60.7. And then the geo bond debt service and payments to the ATL has stayed the same from 23 to 22 at 5% and 1%. So that's the breakout of the overall budget of the two, a little bit under 2.3 billion. Okay, moving into the, basically the, here we go with the mechanics of everything. What you'll see in the geo bond for, um, debt service program, we did a uh, fund source redistribution. So we've taken the motor fuel out of the geo bond debt service and supplanted it with transportation trust fund fees, as well as um, recognize the reduction in the debt service. And we've reallocated those motor fuel funds throughout the other programs. So you can see that there. In capital construction, we have brought in an additional $52.8 million. What that does, it helps us deliver pretty much our existing program, and it helps us offset the extremely high cost of the commodities we're seeing right now. You've heard Russell talk about it a couple of months ago, and he gave his presentation on the cost of steel and all of the other commodities. And then last month, Meg came before you and talked about how the bid awards were coming in 30% over what historically have been estimated. So what this does, it helps us pretty much stabilize our existing program with that $52.8 million. Um, and the capital maintenance program, that $8.7 million, gives us the ability to leverage those um, additional federal funding. So it will help us offset some of those increases that we're seeing in the resurfacing program. So that's what that $8.7 million would do there. There's no change to program delivery and data collections. Um, on the next slide, there's an additional $3.5 million that's being brought in to the admin uh, budget. And what that will do is help us with some much needed software and server upgrades throughout the department. Um, the LAMIG, the 2.4, that brings it to the 10% of our excise. There's no plan changes to the local roads admin program. There's no changes to the planning program. Um, in routine maintenance, that $19.5 million, it goes a long way. It helps us restore our purchasing power that we've lost due to inflation, such in the material cost, the fuel cost, and those ITBs. So that helps us stabilize and restore some of that purchasing power that $19.5 million does. Um, in traffic management, there is no change. Next slide is primarily the intermodal programs. Um, airport aid, ports and waterway and rail all stay the same um, at, the, at their base budgets of 23 that then moved to 24. That basically gives us to leverage our, the additional federal funding as well of the, over $90 million. In the transit, the transportation trust fund fees, that additional 6.1 million you see that makes up the 7.8. What this does, it is the maximum allocation that is left. Um, Y'all may recall in the transportation trust fund that was established, the transportation trust fund normally known as the fee fund, the fees as we refer to it as, up to 10% of that can be used toward transit. So once you fund the allocation of the ATL, and for Greta, the remainder of that 7.8 is the 10% max that is allowed under the fee component to be utilized. Um, in the transit trust fund, which is primarily ride share fees, it stays flat at the 15.9 million. So there's no change from 23 to 24. Next slide is payments to CERTA. What you see here is a reduction in their debt service for their guaranteed revenue bonds and for their Garvey bonds. So all that is is truing up of the debt service and there's no changes to the payments to the ATL. That in whole is the budget recommendation for 24. There was no changes in 23. As you can see, 24 is very clean. Um, and um, Chairman, I will any questions that you have at this time, I'd be glad to take them. Anyone have any questions, comments? Okay. At this time, I would ask for y'all's favorable yeah. approval like out of the committee. I need a motion for approval to carry it to the full board for the morrow. 
Mr. Brown and Ms. Parcell. Well, we have a motion and a second. Do I hear uh, all those in favor say aye? Aye. Aye. All opposed? None opposed. Thank you very much. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank Ms. you. I'd like to call to order our statewide transportation planning strategic planning committee at this time. And today we're going to hear from our uh, individuals within our Department of Direction in regards to state planning. Janine Miller, who will start off and introduce our speaker for today, and it will be on our national electric vehicles. Janine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, committee members and board members. Um, here to present today on our National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program here at GDOT. And uh, Mark Smith will come up and, and speak about the plan, but I wanted to uh, start out with a couple of things. First of all, uh, we have an amazing staff who's been working on this. This, this um, uh, activity set that we are undertaking to implement a federal program is the first time we at GDOT have ever stood up anything like this. Uh, as you might have heard me say before, in the prior century, state DOTs did not, uh, by and large, did not um, install gas stations. Uh, so this is brand new territory for us at GDOT and all the state DOTs around the country. So we are learning a lot as we go. Um, our staff has been uh, incredible in uh, engaging with all of our stakeholders uh, that we've that we found, and there's much more stakeholder involvement and engagement to do. Mark will talk uh, about that. There's a lot for us to learn, and thankfully, there's a lot of folks to, to help us along in this pathway. But I want to thank our staff, uh, led by Matt Markham, Kelly Gwynn, and Mark Smith, predominantly been uh, working on this on the planning side, but also uh, Andrew Heath and John Hibbard. We've been working on this collaboratively with operations to make sure that once we have a plan that is uh, that is approved and, and ready to enact, that it is executable and effective. Uh, so we're working hand in glove with operations office. Um, I also want to thank our consultants who have been tremendous in this. We brought private sector expertise to bear. Um, EY management consulting firm, JLL, a um, real estate commercial real estate firm, um, and HNTB, who's national experts on transportation infrastructure, have all come together and, and been tremendous for us in uh, analysis perspective. Uh, market sounding and, and the like, and uh, we've got a great plan that we have submitted uh, to Federal Highway Administration on time uh, by the end of the day, August 1st, and uh, we are awaiting uh, interaction and engagement with the Joint Program Office of the Department of Transportation and the Department of Energy. Uh, we will hopefully hear about uh, our approval, uh, uh, any questions we might have from the Georgia Division as well, but we are hoping for um, approval of that by the end of September. But that will, I'm going to emphasize this because Mark will say this later, that will just begin the next stage of work. Just because uh, we, we are hoping to and re retrieve this um, approval from Federal Highways and Joint Program Office does not mean the money is ready to, to roll out the door. There's a great deal more work that we need to, to look into to understand um, contracting options, legal parameters, um, what is really going to be best for the customer. Uh, as we work to satisfy the federal requirements. So you'll, we'll, we'll continue the work, but I just wanted to make sure you all know that just because uh, October 1st comes and we've gotten approval from federal highways does not mean we are um, out the door off and running. But before, before we talk about the plan, um, I want to give you a framework um, about uh, what the alternative fuel corridors are. That is a federal designation. Uh, we lead the southeast in number of miles of alternative fuel corridors, and uh, we just had two more corridors approved in rural areas. So I'm going to talk about that. Mark will discuss the um, NEVI program, vision and goals, st stakeholder engagement timeline, and next steps. So phase one of deployment of these dollars, once, once approved, um, we'll, we'll have to go. We will have to invest in our alternative fuel corridors. Uh, these are designated by the Federal Highway Administration. We already had nearly all of our interstate highways as EV ready was the previous terminology. Our mission next will be to get all of our interstate corridors up to EV fully built, fully built out. Um, what you see there uh, in, on this map is that uh, in the pink, those pink corridors, uh, 
fuchsia, magenta, plum, however you might, might want to call it, uh, are uh, already compliant with the federal requirements. That is, four charging stations generating 150 kilowatt hours, 150 kilowatts uh, to each vehicle simultaneously within one mile of the interstate every 50 miles. That's four 150 kilowatts that can charge simultaneously within a mile of the corridor every 50 miles. If it's pink, magenta, plum, those are compliant. If it is in a gold, yellowish color, those are not yet compliant. So those are going to be our target zones for the first uh, tranches of, of federal funds once approved. What I'll draw attention to, though, is not just our interstates in Round six is what it's known as. We it was a sixth round of submission from um, around the country to federal highways to designate more corridors that will be uh, the target for these investments. We nominated two rural, mostly rural corridors and were approved. I'm very excited to, to say that. You can see on the east side of, of the state um, from Cornelia down through Athens, Milledgeville, and Dublin is US 441 and US 82 in the south coming out of the coast in Brunswick over to Tifton and Albany. So these are two predominantly rural corridors where we know that there is a great deal of travel uh, for tourism from metro area to metro area. And our goal here, again, around being customer driven and customer focused in our deployment, where do EV drivers want to go? When they're leaving the metro areas where they predominantly today um, reside, we want to bring comfort and confidence that as they leave their metro areas, they'll be able to, to recharge uh, safely and efficiently uh, in, in rural parts of Georgia. Thus, 441 is a great example of that. Um, but also, US 82 is an, is an example of a, one of our hurricane evacuation routes. We know that it will be important as evacuees are, are migrating out of uh, Florida and South Carolina for them to, to use uh, our corridors and be able to recharge as they're uh, moving to safe shelter. So I-75 out of Florida, I-16 out of the coast, 82 out of the coast, and I-95 out of Florida are four, are four of our key evacuation routes. Those will be uh, important for us. But other reasons that we chose these, addition, these corridors is, is volume of traffic, uh, real estate feasibility is, is, is key for two reasons, uh, at least. One of which is if there's a real estate uh, land use that's occurring uh, for things that customers like to go to, whether it's a fast food restaurant, refueling, um, shopping opportunities, that means there are amenities there and, and places that uh, customers want to go. It also gives us an indication that there's likely sufficient power electric power because the charging station requires the electricity uh, to be sufficient and reliable once it's there. So we believe that real estate feasibility is a good indicator of, uh, of, of um, opportunities to invest. As I mentioned, evacuation route, geospatial balance, we wanted to, uh, again, make sure we're covering rural parts of the state, uh, tourism as, as a key factor, in, and where we believe EV adoption uh, is in the travel of, of electric vehicles. So. Um, before I'm, uh, we move on to the plan, I want to see if there's any questions, and we'll, well, we, otherwise we'll bring Mark up to speak. Any questions so far? Oh, okay. Um, this, this is just a couple other pieces of information uh, around 441. Uh, it's close to the Rivian and SK Innovation, major tourism sites. Um, this is 165 miles, this corridor. Uh, five stations potentially, maybe more. and. Uh, US 82 coming out of the coast, 163 miles. Overall, these two corridors add 27% or almost 330 electric vehicles uh, will be fully built out uh, corridors throughout the state. Okay, Mark. <coughs> yes, uh, and I think this question may have been addressed the last time we had a discussion about this and you may have gone over it, but when, you, when we have these stations, what what do you envision a station that might look like? I know you referenced an example maybe of um like a shopping mall or someplace where people are already going. But is that is that what you envision the stations to be, or could they just be, or could they also be freestanding 
stations for that purpose only, much like you find a gas station today? I think it's going, it's going to depend on the location. Um, for instance, uh, in places like Athens, uh, even Metter and Dublin, there are lots of uh, retail opportunities for travelers to stop. Maybe it's at a fast food restaurant, maybe it's at a gas station. Um, and I don't know if you've been to, and I think Kevin might have been to the Tesla supercharging station in uh, Metter. It's on site with a Parker's gas station so that those Tesla drivers can take advantage of, uh, yes, the Parker's uh, um, convenience store options, but also there's a, apparently a really good barbecue uh, restaurant uh, about 50 feet away. So it could be a free. It could be attached to a gas station. It could be in um, any private sector. We imagine uh, land. Um, there might be some places like um, in Pierce in uh, US on US 82 that that in order to comply with the every 50 miles, we might have to be more creative in finding a place uh, to install those chargers. It's going to vary across the state. <laughs> I have another question for you, Ms. Miller. I don't know that I, I don't know that I need that thing. Um, so I, I was drawing a picture in my mind of, of the hurricane evacuation, and I've been a part of that more than one time. So there's going to be 50 to 100,000 cars on the road leaving the coast. And, and I just, I'm trying to envision how they're moving at three or four miles an hour with their air conditioner on. And I mean, like three or four charging stations, I, what happens? I mean, you're gonna have 70,000 cars run out of battery on on the interstate. I, I And I'm not saying anything bad, I'm just trying to figure out how this is gonna work when you really have high demand. It, it will be a challenge, uh, but we believe that EV adoption is going to, as it ramps up, the deployment of the NEVI program will be ramping up equally. It's not as though there's 70,000 that are going to be EVs that are evacuating next year. Um, it, that that adoption is going to going to roll up, and so will ours. Also, it's important that we will absolutely be looking for where there are opportunities to to uh, get these EV charging stations deployed in these evacuation routes in partnership with the private sector. Those will be a primary focus for us initially, but we also uh, see ourselves as a catalyst. We see GDOT funds and these NEVI program funds as a catalyst, and uh, even across the nation, to, to begin to engender comfort by the um, by a vehicle purchaser to, to to purchase an electric vehicle. But then also to and as that happens, the private sector will begin to invest its own money in more charging throughout. The state. So we are not going to solve uh, the EV charging challenge by ourselves. We will be um, a catalyst, and we are going to look for the the most effective ways to deploy the money, as well as stretch out the federal federal dollars as far as we can. Has there been contemplation of putting massive EV charging stations in our rest stops? Uh, we will consider that, but there are some um, laws, yeah, federal and state, that are end up being a barrier to that. Um, one of them does not allow us as a state DOT to uh, charge a fee in any commercial form uh, at our rest stops along interstate highways. Um, another federal requirement is every 50 miles. We don't necessarily have every 50 mile rest area in those on those yellow gold locations that we're looking for. Um, so we're, we're, we will consider that, but we've got uh, and there's there's state. Uh, constitutional barriers we think to that as well. Mr. Bowen. Thank you, Janine, and looks great, but is this really a plan for investment more so than just the private sector? When you say these charging stations, you know, you're going to have them every 50 miles and that uh, th this is an investment that the government is going to institute through the state, where it's the GDOT, whatever, to install these EV stations? And then where does the private sector play in all this? Private sector meaning some guy that want to put one where a gas station is today, does he have that right? Or is it going to be under some form of 
permitting process and that are not going to be allowed because, well, we don't have enough power here and this and that. Is that kind of the way it's going to work? You touched on a handful of things, and then there's another three dozen things that mm -hmm. we have to consider. So but it's all part of the system that you're going to eventually get into over time. Is that correct? Time. That's right. That's right. And this is, uh, if, if I understood one of your questions correctly, this is not regulatory okay. in any that's, way, that's shape, or form. Thing, right? This yeah. is simply the methodology we're going to take to deploy the dollars okay. um, in a compliant way that's customer driven, um, that uh, is effective and efficient in, in deployment. Okay. And Mark will tell you more about the plan. Okay, great. All right. Mr. Just, w just, just no, one more I'm question sorry. and then yeah. we'll get Mark up. Uh, I'm too stupid to use this, so I'll, <laughs> obviously. Um, but so a couple of things. Um, our federal requirement to have a station every 50 miles. If it so happened there was a a uh, private sector station that would work, would we skip that, or are we required to have every 50 miles, even though private sector is across the street? Uh, if there is a charging station, regardless of of today who owns and operates that four by 150 kilowatt, that is considered compliant, right? Yes. And that's why we have so much pink magenta plum on the map. So those are, that box is checked at that 50 mile location. And will we look for land leases to put these on or will we own the equipment or who? We will be examining all kinds of options. Okay. Commissioner, do you wanna? Uh, so you haven't decided that, you just, right. you just know you gotta put them there. Out. Okay. Yeah, I would. Thank you. I, great commentary. I, I think we need to dive in a little deeper into this presentation that will set the table a little bit for some of the questions you guys are getting to. All very good questions. Lots of things still to be determined. When we say plan, this what is submitted was the federal requirements to check the boxes, basically to to do the work with a lot of. And Mark's going to get into a lot of work that's been done to identify what's out, even just to identify what's out there first and foremost, to find these gaps that have to be filled. The ultimate, how this gets implemented is to be determined. And that's what Janine was saying earlier, that we're not ready to, we're not ready to say we're ready to procure this or make this happen. Um, one of the last slides you'll see is about there's an EV or electric mobility commission that's being stood up from the House and Senate and myself and uh, the uh, chair of economic, oh not chair, but the uh, commissioner of economic development are part of that as well for the legislature to do more deliberation on this very issue, which will inform that outcome of that may inform how we ultimately implement a plan. So let, let Mark get into that, and then I think there are still lots of robust questions and conversations to be had, but we'll set the table a little bit of, of sort of, you know, what the level of efforts has been to get to this point. All right, let's let Mark go ahead and speak to us at this time, and then if there's questions and we have time, we'll certainly go into that. Mark, Perfect. welcome. Thank you. Um, just want to remind everyone uh, the purpose and the goals of the NEVI formula program. Uh, from the US DOT and DOE um, for us to uh, keep in mind why we are doing this um, is to one, create a nationwide network of 500,000 chargers uh, by the year 2030 um, and to ensure a convenient, uh, reliable, affordable, and equitable charging experience for all users. And the goals of this program um, is to accelerate equitable adoption um, of EV vehicles um, and uh, for those uh, that cannot reliably charge at home. Two, to reduce transportation related greenhouse emissions um, and help put the US on a path to net zero uh, emissions by no later than 2050 and to position US industries to lead global transportation electrification uh, efforts. A little overview of the NEVI program is it is $5 billion in total funding um, for over five years, and that is fiscal years uh, 22 to 20, uh, 26. Georgia, uh, subject to appropriations, has been apportioned uh, approximately $135 million with a maximum 80% uh, federal share. 
And Nevi has required GDOT to prepare a plan that is compliant uh, with federal requirements from Federal Highways to Joint Office of Transportation and Energy, um, along with uh, with their guidance, along with frequently asked questions, notice for proposed rulemaking, um, and uh, continuous webinars and engagement with the Joint Office. There are key elements um, of the plan. Um, and these key elements are uh, just a handful. There are many uh, elements, but the ones that got us through to the important milestone of August 1st are stakeholder engagement, uh, equity benefits, and compliance with Justice 40, uh, workforce development, and infrastructure deployment. The program requires us to first fully build out our existing alternative fuel corridors in the first year. Uh, before the secretary certifies uh, the state to be, uh, so that the secretary can certify the state to be fully. What that means, um, as Janine mentioned earlier, is a minimum of four uh, 150 kilowatt uh, DC fast chargers. Um, and those are, uh, sorry, with the combined charging system, so CCS ports. Um, that are able to be used for all EV vehicles uh, to charge there. Um, it is a minimum of 50 miles apart and no more than a mile off uh, from the corridor. Uh, Georgia has 11 compliant stations um, and we are working in that first year to fill in the gaps between 30 to 35 um, new, uh, new sites or upgraded sites. It requires us to satisfy Justice 40 requirements to ensure that the benefits, uh, that this program benefits 40% or that 40% of the benefits are seen in disadvantaged communities. Um, and here in Georgia, uh, that is a priority us for rural Georgia. Um, we are required um, to be compliant with Buy America and a whole list of other requirements. One of the important things for us to know here um, as we get into questions about the implementation is that this is evolving guidance. Uh, we received our first guidance in February, uh, the notice for proposed rulemaking in June, and we're waiting on the final rules, uh, which we should expect in the next month or two. Uh, we received additional ADA guidance um, this month, and um, you know some of the other uh, components that we're waiting to get additional guidance on is cybersecurity, uh, data requirements and reporting and etc. Moving on to our plan, um, here is our vision uh, for the implement, uh, for the deployment of our EV plan um, is to one be compliant with federal requirements, two um, that our plan uh, aims to be customer uh, driven, uh, so we want to know where the customers are and where we'll, uh, and where they will be. Um, so that is important for the implementation here. And uh, economic development, making sure that the sites are in a place that can generate economic development opportunities uh, for EV, uh, uh, for electric vehicles. And also, um, as we mentioned earlier, GDOT is not interested in owning, operating, or maintaining these. So we look um, at private partnership to fully, uh, to, uh, to fully deliberate and operate this EV charging infrastructure across the state. Um, and lastly, uh, to be sure that these chargers are sustainable um, and reliable over the five years um, in which they are installed. Where we are now as we submitted our plan on August 1st, uh, we are continuing to do our planning work as well as uh, laying the groundwork for implementation. Uh, our planning work, um, laying our planning work. Uh, and, I do think Ms. Key has it. Yeah. Sorry. Georgia Power Power? Yes, we are partnering with uh, every major utility company, and I do have a slide which we'll talk about the work that we have done and we'll continue to do with Please them. continue. Yes. Um, and so a part of this continued work as the commissioner mentioned is the state legislator um, is convening an electric vehicle charging study committee uh, this month. Um, and so we will be continuing to monitor 
Uh, that work continued to monitor the further uh, guidance from the federal government um, before we arrive to our September 30th uh, notice of approved plan or required changes. The plan has uh, required us to do um, some extensive stakeholder engagement to date. Um, here you will see some of the key partners that we have met with um, between February and August 1st and are continuing to meet with. Uh, those are private businesses who represent uh, potential vendor and site host, uh, state agencies, um, as we understand the impact of electric vehicle supply equipment, um, their role uh, to help us identify needed support and integrate NEVI planning across the state. Uh, there are equity communities, again, to uh, satisfy the Justice 40 requirements. Um, and they helped us to understand the needs of underserved um, and disadvantaged communities with regards to electric vehicle charging. Um, our planning partners to include the metropolitan planning organizations and local governments. Our border states, um, as we learned from them, of their firsthand experience of NEVI planning and lessons learned. Um, our OEMs, um, and these represent electric vehicle supply equipment um, uh, suppliers and developers uh, for the vehicles. Um, and lastly, utilities. And the utilities represent the local uh, power supply and um, EVSE operator, uh, oper owner operator models. Some of the key insights um, into uh, from our stakeholders um, are also here. Uh, so, for example, private businesses um, help to inform um, in, 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 in a two way the business case for, uh, for or inform the private sector of GDOT business case um, of a customer driven approach for this plan. Um, and then also to understand the laws um, that are unique to Georgia and the equity community. Um, again, that helped us to make sure that we have conformance with uh, Justice 40 requirements and opportunities that may arise um, for the delivery of these services in disadvantaged communities. And to the utilities, um, in June of this year, uh, GDOT hosted a public working group with every major utility company um, in the state. Um, and here, um, in that meeting, in our continuing work with them, they've helped us understand uh, how to assess um, our grid power availability, uh, the upgrade costs that will be needed, uh, strategies and the approaches to ownership and make ready, as well as uh, rates, tariffs, and other requirements for um, electric vehicle supply equipment and suppliers. The next steps, um, again, as we mentioned, September 30th is awaiting JPO approval um, of the plan, uh, followed by the availability of the funds, um, as well as continue to monitor the General Assembly's EV commission study. Um, we are now moving into the phase of public involvement to seek comment on the plan that we have submitted. Um, and that includes continued stakeholder engagement and a continued analysis of location deployment uh, based on customer driven factors. So where should we go um, and where is it most effective for us to deploy this infrastructure um, in compliance with federal requirements and to continue to monitor federal guidance um, rules and further engagement with JPO. Um, I will note here that we now have a website uh, to direct constituents and the public to. Um, on this website, you will be able to uh, locate the plan uh, to review it, uh, share it with others, as well as program requirement information um, and contact information to submit public comments to. And with that, I will end and stand for questions. Do I have any questions? Yes, Kevin. Uh, I'm trying to reconcile some of the numbers I saw in your presentation. Um, I saw something that I think said 11 existing stations and a couple of slides back, 11 existing and there you go. 
um, and 30 to 35 gaps. So a couple of related questions here. The first question is, does that mean the sum total of these four charger units is order of magnitude 40, 45? That yep. covers all the routes. And, and, and that said, you know, when I looked at the magenta and gold, are those the right colors, Janine? Um, okay. Thanks. Um, it, it, it looked like the proportion of magenta to gold was more than 20%, yet this seems to suggest only 20% of the, of the routes are covered. Um, how do you reconcile that? Uh, that one, Janine, I may need your help on that one. <laughs> so. I mean, it seems like you've got a pretty substantial portion of the state covered, but that there's only 11 stations that, that accomplish that goal? So let's, let's look at, um, I can have to make sure it's online and recorded. So on, look at 16, for instance, uh, between Macon uh, mm -hmm. and Savannah. That's roughly 150 miles. So we'll have to put two along I-16 to get us there. To compliant, to fully built out compliant. Mm -hmm. So why there's so much magenta just happens to be where there is a station that that is the farthest out. So there might be one on I-20, like in like barely in uh, Cobb County, for instance. But it, it stretches it out 50 miles from there. Okay. Okay. And and final question related to all this. Um, can I assume then that? Um, I think Tesla stations are not available to non-Tesla still. Does that mean that doesn't conform to the NEVI? Um... As, as of today, yes, that is correct. It does, does not comply with, with um, the NEVI requirements because it's not open to the public, to the general Thanks. public. Ms. Bowen? In the presentation, you said that you have a, is that a bank of EVs, like 450 kilowatts per location is that correctly so if you got four look if you got four evs 150 kilowatt each is 600 question i have is how long or what does that charge require in other words when you have a bank you, and i guess you have when you have four that means you can have four people charging at one time is that correct so then you ask the question how long does it take to charge so that's going to be the question mark based on volume and what you're going to need across the state and so consequently to me that's the most important thing is in in these distances as well as timing uh, how long it takes to charge will be up to the customer it'll uh depends on how long they do they want to get up to a full charge or do they just well let's just assume that they're traveling because a lot of these quarters are traveling quarters mm -hmm. and so they're traveling so whatever their distance of travel is going to be what is going to be, you know, if you have a full, let's, let's just assume that it's a third, you know, I, I got a third, I got a charge. It's kind of like you're going to have the same mentality as a guest, in my opinion, you know, how people think. It's the same, you know, situation. And the question is, and that's been the questions that I hear every day is, I, I, but I won't get into that. I just want to know based on what you're going to be doing what's going to be the timing you know if a car pulls in there three quarters of a charge how long would it take Does anybody know that question it, it will depend on the the vehicle and the um type of battery that is in that vehicle the the dc fast charging is intended to get from i believe it's from 20 percent to 80 percent fully charged in 20 to 30 minutes so it's okay that's that's an, that's what i'm looking for 20 to 30 minutes so we have to factor that in on how many cars would be able to use it if, if they're backed up or waiting or whatever. So timing is everything, as you know, in what, how we live our life in today's world. And, and let me also let you know that just because four is the requ minimum requirement, that doesn't preclude the site host from installing more at that time mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or adding on at a later time. Okay. Well, Mr. Basel. Was kind of, my question was, if you're qualified, and I don't know how you're qualified exactly, can you put in as many as you want to in a specific location? Uh, is there competition, or are we limited to a certain vehicle charger in any one particular area, 
Well, how, how, how is the competition or is it? Lots to be worked out. There, we will. Add, we are aiming to have competition uh, for the the site host to, to get uh, the award of the federal money. We'll we will have to have a competition. The factors of that competition will be based on the federal requirements. Things like ninety seven percent uptime, as in available ninety seven and, and operational ninety seven percent of the time. Available twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. Um, cybersecurity amenities available. There's a long list of requirements. Cost is part of that as well. Cost? It will be. It certainly will be. Yeah. Well, I, well we can finish. I just want to, okay. if, if you have one station, could you have another one within 30 miles or 20 miles? Absolutely. Or, or yeah. They, okay. yeah, this is not restrictive okay. in any way. Right. Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Uh, I'm curious. The, the state of Georgia participating in this is—is is this something the state voluntarily chose to participate in, or we—or we were conscripted somehow to participate in this? The federal government apportioned every state DOT a, a dollar amount based on a formula, and so there's 100. We believe there could be up to 135 million dollars, depending on appropriations, over the next five years that's available for us to spend. So we were incentivized to participate. And that was GDOS decision or some other state agency's decision. It, the money's come to fe from federal highways to Georgia DOT as part of our whole federal package, and um, the joint program office is available to to help us out. If I believe if we decided not to deploy the fund, not to not to go through the steps and deploy the funds, would there be a penalty? Is that maybe the question too? I, and I yeah, I'm just trying to yeah, Commissioner. I don't know if that if you've heard anything like that. No. Uh, and I'm glad we're participating. Don't get me wrong. I was just curious as you know how that came about. Were we kind of forced to, or incentivized to, or voluntarily took or taken advantage of something they're offering? We a little bit of both, and we want to continue to be a leader in the state of Georgia in EV uh, deployment. Miss Key. For private sector, there's a revenue opportunity. I was at a meeting yesterday. They brought this up about uh, groups coming together to use this as a revenue stream in terms of the stations throughout the state and working with GDOT. So, any addition questions? Additional officer TBD commissioner. I know. Yeah. Yes. I suspected. Yeah, let me just let me just sum up. One, I want to commend Janine and. Mark and the entire team that's done a lot of work. Um, if you if you look back at that timeline, and Mark mentioned this, uh, they've been building the airplane while they've been flying it, because we still don't have all the guidance federally. Uh, again, got first guidance in February. This was due August 1st, and as late as June 9th was the last guidance put out for public comment, which we don't know what those answers are going to be yet. So th this is a very dynamic. Uh, process. Uh, a couple things I wanted to highlight was, again, this by no way has anything to do with limiting or restricting, regulating or permitting private industry from deploying chargers. The, the sort of the challenge, I always, always say, let's talk about the problem we're trying to solve. The reason that there's gold on the state is because it doesn't make business economic sense for the private sector to be there today. And so it's a little bit of a chicken and the egg with EV deployment and adoption continuing to grow uh, and having that infrastructure in place because uh, there's not necessarily a business case at the moment. So this again is trying to help, not, not provide for, but to help private industry meet that business case such that there's, there's more charging opportunities which supports EV growth uh, that is certainly uh, anticipated and forecast uh, uh, nationally in here in Georgia. So that's just I just want to go back to that because uh, it's you know I just want to make sure it's really clear that our GDOT has no approval if somebody wants to put a, a NEVI charging station that meets these uh, federal requirements out today, they're free to do so. They just have to deal with their normal zoning and, you know, building permits and everything they would do wherever they're building that, you know, a C store or McDonald's or whatever commercial development. So uh, that's all part of it. Um, the other part of this is we've only talked about the formula grant dollars, which 
uh, Mr. Lewis, this is just like any federal program. Every, you know, I forget how many federal programs there are now. You know, it's like 13 to 15 major buckets with sub buckets under that. This is just one of those buckets of federal dollars uh, that's available to you. So uh, there, that's all we've talked about today. The 135 million dollar. That again, we, we, reason we caveat that is everything's subject to annual appropriation. So we'll see how that comes out uh, in five years. But uh, that's formula dollars. There are also discretionary grant programs that will be made available in two two main categories. And those categories are in, uh, y'all help me with the two categories. Community charging and corridor charging. Say it, say it aloud, Mark. Community charging and corridor charging. Right. And one of Mark's things he mentioned before was uh, in air communities where you can't charge at home. So if you think about multifamily, uh, it's a little bit hard when you don't have a garage to charge your vehicle. So, so things like that, uh, and then obviously the Justice 40 component of that will be part of the uh, part of the look as well uh, for the discretionary dollars. So there's going to be some other dollars coming forward for local communities uh, to go after uh, cities, counties, um, and, and potentially the state as well. We'll just have to see. Those rules have yet not to come out yet either so we don't even have the playbook for that yet so the first focus back to what janine's early statement is we're focused on the interstates and uh as she said and i don't want anybody to lose this because it's important if you look at a map of the nation especially the southeast and you can go go online and find it you'll see that georgia has probably most of the alternative fuel corridors of any of our surrounding states more than florida florida has a lot of uh, alternative fuel, not ready, but what do they call them, pending, pending, but we have probably the most ready, uh, which gives us a huge advantage in deploying these dollars. So uh, a lot of good work, a lot more to come in the how do we roll this out, and um, that's going to fall over into Meg's side of the house as planning has stood up a plan. Uh, the implementation uh, will come through the chief engineer's office. And we have a, we still have a lot of data to gather. We have, we expect lots of industry input and, and conversation. And my guess is that there's multiple tools in the delivery toolbox uh, of what shape, size, form uh, that we will deploy these federal dollars uh, with, in partnership with the private sector somehow to accomplish this plan. Uh, I don't think there's a one size fits all. Uh, it's a very it's a very different world, as Janine said. You know, we've never been in deciding where to put gas stations, but the big difference is you don't have to have a tank in your underground for this. All you have to do is have the right electricity. So it changes the where locations and things can be uh, tremendously. So I commend them for good work to be done. There's still a lot of work to do on the we are here thing, like you see at the mall. And, and the error to the right is uh, to be determined. We've got a lot of work to do. Uh, there's going to be a lot of, it's going to be, you're going to probably have, hear a lot more conversation and you, you'll you probably have a lot of questions about uh, when when are you guys going to do this? Um, we've got to move uh, cautiously uh, so that we get this right. It's very important that uh, the term, we don't end up with charging stations that are not functional uh, there is a requirement, again, for uptime and connectivity and safety and security and all those kind of things, but we want to make sure this is right so it's successful. And uh, and we've got a lot to learn about how we'll interface with this. There's a multitude of businesses, uh, as Janine showed on that funnel slide, obviously sort of C-stores seem to be a reasonable, you know, it's already that experience of fueling your vehicle at those at those locations. Uh, it's a great business strategy. They like for you to come into their store and buy products. Uh, you know, when you buy, if you buy gas now. Uh, so the same thing for EV charging. Um, but there's other there's other entities too. And as there's already chargers out there, there's already third party people like Electrify America and many others. I, I'm not calling them out particularly, but there's many other companies that are already in this business as well. So uh, we look to we look to continue to work and partner with uh, all the interested parties and craft our procurement such that we uh, make this 
right for Georgia. Uh, I, I've I actually uh, have opportunity to be a convener for a national EV committee uh, through AASHTO. Uh, I have yet to hear of any state that says that the state is going to own and operate EV chargers. Uh, so there's no state that I'm aware of that says we're going to be in the EV charging business and uh, they'll have their state logo and a phone number to call on it to a DOT. Everybody's looking for this public-private partnership arrangement going forward that, that I'm aware of. So uh, we'll, we'll keep you informed. Uh, we'll certainly keep you informed. Josh will be reporting out uh, on the EV commission in the future as that uh, work uh, stands up as we go through that this uh, fall. And I'll keep you abreast of that information too. But a lot more, uh, this scratch, the, I don't want to underestim underestimate the hard work or not give credit for the hard work that's been done to get to this point, but we've scratched the surface and now we've got to continue to figure out how to deploy. And, uh, and a good, uh, also again to, to Janine and the team, I want to commend them on the partnership with the private sector and all those entities Mark mentioned. And I think, was it six electric providers? I think you said four. That doesn't sound like a lot, but one of them represents all the EMCs basically or supplies all the EMC. So we have great cover, basically the entire state coverage of electric grid information. And uh, and again, uh, very good information to, to share and work collaboratively together with our of our private partners. So uh, Madam Chair, I'll turn that back over to you. Thanks for the, letting me have the commentary, dialogue, and last word. Thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner and Janine and Mark. As you see that this is um, a plan in progress and we all have a lot of questions in regards to what is going to happen across our state and why it's happening and what areas it's happening in. And I appreciate the update today as we're all eager to learn more and more as we progress forward. So if there's not any other questions or comments, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. I'll call the meeting up of the P3 committee to order and Tim uh, Matthews, our State Express Lanes Coordinator uh, Administrator is going to give us an update on the Georgia 400 Express Lanes project. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, members of the board and commissioner. Pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to talk about uh, the State Route 400 Express Lane project and give you an update and status of what's going on uh, as we are today. Uh, as you recall, we'll give a project well, I'll go ahead and give a project overview. So it's important to remember what this project is and what we're bringing to the users on this corridor. Give you a procurement status update and current activities that are currently going on. I can't go too deep in the procurement status because we're in the procurement right now, but uh, we'll go into some details we can talk about. We'll talk about express lane transit, and I'll remind you what that is and what that means on the State Route 400 corridor, and certainly as it relates to MARTA and BRT coordination, which is a bus rapid transit utilizing State Route 400 uh, in moving forward. So those are the things we'll focus on today. If you remember, uh, State Route 400 uh, starts and begins at the North Springs MARTA station and it brings two express lanes buffer separated in each direction going north to McGinnis Ferry Road. When did, from there we transition from McGinnis Ferry, one lane in each direction to north of McFarland Parkway. What you see on the screen there in the little circles on the corridor itself are access points. Some of those are direct access to and from 400 proper, and the other circle locations are access interchanges that will be new and built on this corridor as we bring the project forward. That will get you a connection to the express lanes from local network along the corridor. The two photos you see on the screen there are Grimes Bridge, south-facing access point just north of the Chattahoochee River in the city of Roswell and Tradewinds uh, Parkway there, a new full interchange north and southbound access points on the south, uh, on the picture there on the south. So that's what we're bringing uh, to State Road 400 as it relates to express lanes on this corridor. Some of the current activities that are underway right now, as I mentioned, uh, we're under procurement, started back in March of this year. Uh, however, we did bring what we call a State Route 400 Phase 1 uh, procurement out of the original larger project to advance several bridge replacements that we thought would get out of the way before the bigger project comes on. Those bridge replacements include Pitts Road over 400, Roberts Drive over 400, and Kimball Bridge Road over 400. 
that project uh, started its procurement several months ago and actually received NTP for con design and construction uh, August 1st, 2022. So we've got that project underway. CW Matthews is the contractor for that project and ISIS, the design engineer, working with them to bring that project forward. Submittals have already started coming in for review, so it's well underway with a contract duration time of 633 days. So we'll get that project complete before the bigger project comes along out there. You also see on there risk management. We've uh, looked at this corridor and tried to identify a lot of major risk components that really bring up the price when you bring the larger project uh, forward. So what we've identified is several risk elements that we thought we should get out of the way before the express lane project comes out for construction. Those two items include colonial pipeline relocation, which crosses underneath uh, State Route 400. That project relocation is actually complete. They completed that in June of this year. So that's a huge risk element that we've pulled out of the express lane project that could cause delays and cost a lot of money down the line. We just started the uh, old Alabama 48 inch waterline relocation. Now that's a city of Atlanta procured project. They're managing that and they've hired the engineers and consultant contractors to do that work. But we've been working with them hand in hand to make sure they understand what they're doing is consistent with what we're trying to bring forward with express lanes. The design builder was selected and NTP one was issued in May of 22. Uh, construction is slated to begin September 2022, substantial completion March of 2023 and final completion in May of 23, just before we select our developer for the State Route 400 express lane project. So another huge risk element that we're taking out of the out of our developers' hands such that can cause delays and obviously increased cost uh, down the line. Some other activities that we're underway right now is right-of-way acquisition. We're getting a lot of right-of-way purchase so that once we get the developer on board, they're not spending the first two or three years buying all the right away. We want to make sure that they can go to work as quickly as possible. So we're doing a lot of that acquisition uh, for ourselves. There is um, 169 parcels assigned to this project. 64 parcels are acquired, 12 pending closing. So this gets us about 45% completed right away with another year and more to get that work done before the developer comes on board. Uh, the other good news is the environmental document is approved on this project, which is a major milestone that, that allows us to go to uh, selection of a developer and ultimately get to construction. Uh, that project is under a reevaluation right now just because of the new procurement that we're bringing forward. I want to talk a little bit about what goes into these procurements. They're, they're not small procurements, and these are not small projects. You're talking about a billion or so dollar project, a couple of billion dollar project here. So there's a lot that goes into it to get a package ready for the developers to be interested in and bid on to come build these projects for us. What you see on the screen here are several components of the package that we put together with our team of advisors on the engineering, the legal, and the financial side to put a, a RFP or request for proposal out there so the developers can bid on the work. Those include instructions to proposers, just exactly what it is, instructions. The project agreement itself, which is the main, the main uh, uh, agreement that ties the department, or the, ties the state, excuse me, to the developer and what we're asking them and what we're all committed to do as far as the contract is concerned. Then you have several items such as technical provisions, which is a um, uh, exhibit to the PA or project agreement, which is exactly what it says, technical provisions, all those things, technical specifications and things that we want them to adhere to when they bring the project forward. We also have reference information documents. Those are reference materials that are not binding contractually, but they are there for them to use to understand what we're asking them to do, how to build on the project and, and what goes into the project that we're bringing forward. And then we have what we call a toll services agreement, which is also an exhibit to the PA, a project agreement that sets forth the parameters of the toll requirements that the developer needs to meet and adhere to for the long-term operations and of the project itself. So a lot of work in partnership with our partner, CERTA, State Road and Tollway Authority. Uh, they're the contracting uh, holder with the developer and we're tied to them through an MOU and IGA so that we're managing the project and, and they're helping us bring this project forward today. Talked about the procurement has started on this project, which is good news. Uh, we started this back in February. It published a notice of intent to advertise. We had an industry forum, which was well attended, probably between online and in person, over 600 uh, folks involved in that. Uh, we had one-on-one -on -one meetings with folks that were interested in the project. And then we advertised the RFQ or request for qualifications, which is the first phase of the procurement uh, that got started. 
Uh, the next things that are going to happen are the announcement of the shortlist finalist firms. We're going through an evaluation of that, which will happen in September of this year. We'll release the draft uh, request for proposals or RFP in September as well. And then we'll release the final RFP in March of next year with the proposals due in June and developer selection in August of 2023. Now you may ask, why is there so much time between uh, first draft and final draft to get that out? There's a lot of things and activities that have to happen in there, including one-on-one -on -one meetings with the developers who are shortlisted and, and the finalists for this project. So we can get very important feedback, such as risk elements, uh, toll parameters, uh, BRT and MARTA coordination uh, that we, so we can understand and, and build that final RFP. So that's what's happening during that time frame uh, between, uh, between draft and final. I will say here um, that we did receive uh, three uh, uh, SOQs or sum summary of qualifications. Uh, what you see on the screen there are the developers on the left and the next column is the developer teams and the team makeup. That's what we call the equity folks, the finance folks, the bringing the money to the table. Then you have a DBJV team and that third column, that's the folks who typically are the contracting folks that are going to build the project uh, with the developer team. Then you have a lead design uh, firm, which is listed there. They're going to do the final design and anything's getting it ready to, for the construction to start. Then you have a lead O&M firm, which is the lead operations and maintenance entity that's going to do the long-term O&M for the project. And then we have a lead toll operations uh, firm as well. And you can see here, all these are self-performed. So the, the developer team and DBJV team are saying they're going to self-perform O&M and toll operations. Then you have an IQF, which is independent quality firm that'll serve during the life of the project to oversee quality on the project. So that's the list of uh, teams that have submitted SOQs. I will say that uh, this is an open and active procurement and the evaluation of the SOQs is underway and it's not complete. So this is not yet final. And I'll just remind everyone the cone of silence does apply here as it relates to this procurement to GDOT, the board, respondents, and all communications should be uh, between the authorized rep and the contracting officer. And the evaluation is progressing on schedule. So happy to say. As, a, as I said earlier, uh, what is Express Lane Transit? Express Lane Transit is pretty much what it sounds like is using the express lanes to enhance transit on the corridor. There's a lot of corridors out there that uh, don't use uh, that corridor because it's too congested or have limited service because of congestion. So what we're doing is bringing uh, express lanes uh, to, to give drivers a choice to get into the express lanes for reliable trip times, but also provide transit service providers an opportunity to get into that system. Either they weren't before or had limited ability and will now expand potentially uh, by way of express lanes. So using the express lanes as the backbone, if you will. What you see on the screen here are proposed MARTA state or BRT stations along State Route 400, and those BRT stations are in line with MARTA's preferred transit alternative of BRT and is also included in the Fulton County plan, transit plan that was approved as well. Uh, we've hosted uh, multiple workshops with MARTA uh, on the ELT and BRT on the corridor and uh, coordinating with MARTA uh, to advance development concurrently with our project, because ideally you'd like to have express lanes open up, you'd like to have these BRT stations open up at the same time. I will say day one, either way, we'll have an open system for BRT because we are direct connecting directly into the MARTA station at North Springs and directly into the Windward Park and Ride facility at the end that are already open and operating today. So uh, hopefully we're aligned, but if we're not, we can still have BRT service day one when we open express lanes. And you'll also see on there two other station locations at Holcomb Bridge Road, which is that image on the bottom. We're building, leaving space underneath Holcomb Bridge Road interchange to build a future station. And then at North Point Mall in the center of 400, we're leaving space for a future station build out there as well. And I think um, I think you'll you'll see here that this this project and the in conjunction with our express lanes really demonstrates how express lanes are a truly multimodal mobility option on the corridor. Just some additional benefits to highlight. Um, as I mentioned, it does improve existing transit operations. I think MARTA obviously does run in that corridor, but it will give them the ability to expand. And certainly with BRT and BRT stations on that corridor, give more reliable trip times for the users of that facility. The transit vehicles will operate toll-free 
in the, in the system, so we will not charge a toll for transit vehicles to get into the system. You will still have to pay the transit for the service, but you don't have to pay a second charge uh, once you get in our system. And then finally, promotes transit-oriented development. We believe that's a huge win for, for transit and the region as it relates to economics and so on. The ability for transit to promote development has been a huge success in the region already. A couple of examples include perimeter area where you got a transit uh, MARTA currently exists and you got a lot of development around that and then Buckhead just for another example. And the benefits we believe go on and on as it relates to transit and BRT on the corridor. With that, that's all I have for an update. I'll entertain any questions you may have. Tim, are there any questions? Come on, you had 100 questions for Janine. OK, Tim, thank you so much for the update. OK, and right on time, uh, we'll call the Committee of the Whole together. Um, Today we just have a uh, Scott Higley coming up for our GDOT website update, please. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Commissioner. Really appreciate the opportunity to come back before you this afternoon. Back in May, <clears throat> I had the opportunity to come before you and share our annual communications update about all things GDOT communications. And I should say almost everything um, because I did leave one thing out deliberately at the time. <coughs> Excuse me. We were still working on one project quietly behind the scenes, which we have done, and I'm proud to announce that we launched our new GDOT website from the ground up on August 1st. Um, this is a significant development for the department in a number of ways. Since the internet came to be, what was it, probably some 30 years ago, um, organizations began using websites to communicate with their customers. And, you know, the way that people use websites, the websites themselves have continued to evolve. I'm going to bring up Ron Battle, and Ron is going to give you an update on our new GDOT website. Ron? All right. Thank you for the opportunity to walk you through our new public-facing website. So websites are an important tool of how agencies communicate with the public. And our website is the most convenient way that our stakeholders can access information on GDOT projects, programs, services, and business resources. I'm going to provide you with an overview of the methodology that we use to conceptualize, develop, and implement our new website. So websites are typically updated every three to five years to keep up with the latest trends in technology and customer needs. And our old website had been in service for over seven years. So in order to continue providing a timely information and services to our customers, we knew that we needed to do a major revamp. So the Office of Strategic Communications and IT worked together to establish the groundwork for a new website that could better meet the growing needs of our customers. So we identified the following goals to create a modern website that positions GDOT as a forward-thinking agency, to provide a website that simplifies the online experience for users, to properly represent GDOT's brand in the tone and voice of the information provided, to use modern design elements to improve the visual aesthetics and content layout of our website. And this also included incorporating our GDOT branding, which we launched in 2018. So developing a new website is a huge undertaking, and we collaborated with a web consultant that had years of experience building public-facing websites for large agencies and for private sector companies. Our collaboration with this consultant actually started during the beginning of uh, COVID-19 uh, as that became more prominent. And so we used this as an opportunity to build a website that was scalable and would allow us to incorporate the latest trends for providing information and services in a digital space. So we felt like the best way to approach building a new website was to perform extensive research to better understand the needs of our customers. And this started with sending out stakeholder surveys to internal employees to gauge how we could best redesign our website. So we had over 100 employees from 16 offices across the department participate in this survey. 
We also had the consultant conduct a series of internal focus groups to learn more about the expectations of our users. And we also researched other agencies and industry websites, including corporate sites such as Coca-Cola and AT&T. And the reason why we want to do this is we want to learn more about how these companies reached out to their customers, how they engaged them, and what services and trends they pushed out uh, to their customers. So we took all this research data that we collected and began to develop the new concept for our website. We created a new content architecture for each of our key stakeholders, and we identify key stakeholders as the general public, consultants, contractors, and vendors, local government entities, and transportation partners. We also use Google Analytics to identify the most frequently accessed information across our website. And we established our brand identity through consistent use of our logo, our icons, and branding colors. So after the concept of the new website was approved, we began development. We started by implementing a completely revamped navigation menu that reorganized content into user-centered categories. Uh, this made options easier to understand and utilize clear calls to action. It allows users to quickly understand core services and programs under each section. It also increased confidence that our site has relevant and valuable information to offer. Uh, we also developed a new layout that makes key content more prominent. And we reduce content by adding more visual components, such as images, buttons, and graphics. So as a part of the redesign, we added a few new features to our website. We added a new design scheme to the navigation menu to make accessing content a lot easier. We use SEO-friendly URL structure for keyword optimization. And now this helps customers who use major search engines such as Google or Bing find transportation-related information a lot easier. We also use more visual components and incorporated larger fonts to make our site more readable. And we also took a mobile-first-friendly uh, mobile friendly approach. So a lot of people who access our site tend to use mobile devices such as cell phones or tablets to access content. So we want to make sure that people who use these devices, which is growing, we want to make sure that they can access our site with no issue. We also added social media connectivity uh, throughout our site. And as you know, social media is the primary way that a lot of people access content. So we wanted to make sure that this information was accessible throughout our site. So I've actually put together a few screenshots of our new site. Um, so as I walk through the new site, in front of you, you have a tablet. Uh, we have preloaded the new site on there. So as I walk through these screenshots, feel free to go through the site. So one of the first things you're going to notice with our new site is that it's a lot cleaner, a lot easier to read, information stands out. And one of the key sections that we added was a quick links drop down. Now, what we did was we actually went through Google Analytics to pull the five most frequently accessed pages on our site, and we put that in the quick link section. And the reason why we did that is we wanted to make this information easier to find without people having to scroll through our navigation menu or to search throughout our website. Here is our Contact Us button. Uh, so we actually receive about 300 inquiries a month. So we wanted to make sure that people who wanted to submit comments or had questions about our department or wanted to make suggestions could easily do that right there at the top of the page by clicking on our Contact Us button. As you know, a lot of people who come to our site are looking for travel information. That's actually housed in our 511 site. So we wanted to create a button right there at the top without people having to scroll throughout the site to be able to click on that and get to travel information quickly. So here is our search window. So a lot of people who come to our site, they're not going to go through our navigation menu. Or they're not going to scroll. What they're going to do is actually go to our search window and type in a key term. So we want to make sure that this stood out. We're actually asking people a question of how can we help you find information? So we again, this is a way that we're reaching out to our customer base to make sure that we're providing timely and, and easy to find content. 
So as you look down below uh, that section, uh, one thing you will notice is that our web banner is a lot bigger and that's intentional. We wanted to make sure that this stood out. This was the first thing that you saw on our website. A lot of times what we do is we push out announcements and key information in this section. And you will notice that the, the actual text on the banner is a lot bigger. So it's a lot more readable. It's not something that you will easily miss. Again, that banner being big uh, just stands out. So as I scroll down, the featured news and project section, these are all press releases that uh, we push out on a daily basis. So we can actually curate all that information, all the press releases, all the announcements that we typically push out, and we can place this under the featured news and project section. So this is actually uh, dynamically generated. All we do is go in and tag it, and we can push that information right here, right underneath the banner. Um, that little circle with the guy in the middle is a blue circle right there at the bottom right corner, uh, that is our accessibility icon. So we have to meet ADA compliance. And so by clicking on that icon, people who have disabilities, whether they be visual or otherwise can click on that, they can reorganize our website based on um, the options within that tool. So as I continue to scroll down, one of the things you'll see here is how GDOT serves Georgia. So we wanted to organize all of our intermodal uh, services and programs in one area. One thing you'll notice is that we have icons. Um, instead of using text, we want to break up the text and use more visual components, as I mentioned before. And so here we're using icons to identify um, our intermodal programs. We've actually mixed in a couple of other programs, such as our traffic operations um, and, and freight. But we wanted to make it easy for people looking for this information to be able to find that directly on our homepage. And we understand that a lot of people who come to our site are actually looking for this type of information. So we wanted to make it stand out. So the Building a Better Georgia section, this actually speaks to all of our innovative programs that are housed under P3. Uh, this link actually takes you to the P3 page. We actually have another link that will take you to the design build page. But again, if you're looking for innovative programs and projects, that information lives here. Again, we just wanted to call that out on our homepage. Understanding that a lot of people who come to our site are looking for that type of information, we definitely want to make that stand out. And below that, where it says, we're here to help, that is a, uh, a link back to our contact us. As I mentioned before, uh, we wanted to make sure that that information was accessible. You're gonna see that button in several places on our site. I'm just pointing it out here on our homepage. Uh, we just, again, we just wanted to make sure that if people had comments or questions or had suggestions that they wanted to submit to the department, that that information and, and how to do that was very easy to find. So below this is our trending section. And as I mentioned before, a lot of people who come to our site or are looking for transportation related information usually consume that information on social media. That is a growing, medium that a lot of people use to access information. We want to meet people where they are. And so what you see here is a Twitter feed uh, from our main channel. And we have that right here on the right. And on the left, you'll see a button to our social media hub. Uh, that actually points to all of our social media channels that we provide. Uh, we actually have uh, a total of eight channels on Facebook, eight channels on Twitter. We have an Instagram account as well as a YouTube account. Uh, but again, we just wanted to point this information out on our homepage. People are looking for it. They can see everything that we've pushed out on our social media channels. They can actually click on this if they want to go directly into Twitter. But again, if they do not and they want to look at our regional accounts, which we do have an account on Facebook and Twitter for each of our regions, they can click on that and easily get to that information. And at the very bottom, what's highlighted are some key links uh, one of which points to our employment page, which is key right now. Uh, we're doing a lot of recruitment efforts, and so we want to make sure that people who are looking for that type of information can easily get to it in our footer. We have a link to our site map. Um, again, another link to contact us. And at the very bottom is a link to our privacy policy. Uh, again, uh, we just want to indicate how we're using the information. When people come to our site and they submit information or fill out one of our forms, this kind of details what we do with that information. 
So here, I'm going to walk you through our navigation menu. Um, so under travel info and data, just want to highlight how clean and easy it is to navigate through this menu. So now we've organized these buckets based on our users and our stakeholders. So if you're looking for maps and information or maps and data, that information lives here. Uh, users can click down through each of these categories to find the information they're looking for. But one thing I want to point out is, again, is very clean, very easy to read. We actually have brief descriptions under each link. And one of the things we found out in our research is that in our old site, a lot of people would click and not know where they were going. So we wanted to put a brief description under each link to help people understand what they were clicking on before they clicked on it. Also, one of the innovations that we added to this site is that when you click on the navigation button, and one of the options, it actually stays open. So in our old site, when you would move around our navigation menu, it was a pop-up menu. So as you moved around, it would click off. It was kind of hard to keep your mouse or your finger on it. This actually stays open. So once you click on it, it stays open, allows you to click through all the options, and you can read through each of these. So I'm just kind of giving you a, uh, a walkthrough of some of these uh, menu options. I'm looking at doing business with GDOT. Um, again, we have a lot of people who uh, do business with our department. We have uh, consultants and contractors, and you can see that we have the information organized into very easy to understand buckets. So if people are looking for business opportunities, uh, we have it actually organized so that if you're a consultant, all your information lives here. If you're a contractor, your information is very easy to find, as well as if you're a vendor, you can go into one bucket, one section, and get everything that you need. So moving into local governments, again, uh, we wanted to curate this information based on our users. And so what you see here is current and future investments. So people who are looking for this type of information, we have local government entities that frequent our site um, all the time. And so we've placed this information into this section. We also have local programs. And so you'll see here that we have some um, intermodal programs that we've listed as other, as well as some other local programs that are of interest to our local government entities. And then if they're looking for training opportunities, certifications, all that information lives here. So one of the things you will see in our navigation menu is that you'll see some reciprocal links. So if you go into one bucket, you may see a link to certifications and training, and you'll see that in another bucket. And the reason why we did that, we did it intentionally so that customers who go to a specific section, they don't have to come out of it. Everything that they need lives in their bucket. So moving on to programs and funding, again, uh, one of the things you will see is that we're using more visual components at the very top. You see the icons that outline some of our intermodal programs. Again, we wanted to make that information stand out just like we did on our homepage. You see we have the same concept on our navigation menu. So again, if people are looking for intermodal programs and services or very specific information, they don't really have to read through a menu. They can easily click and they can look at it and then make their decision if this is the information that they want. And about GDOT, again, um, this just organizes the information. Uh, you see this in most um, state DOT or state agency websites. But again, it's a lot cleaner if you're looking for GDOT um, organization information, such as offices and divisions or our districts or our transportation board is right there, very easy to find, uh, not a lot of clicking. Uh, and even if you do want to scroll through each of the menu options, again, it's very clean, very easy to navigate. So I'm gonna quickly walk you through um, a couple of our pages. I've pulled together um, our major project section. Um, again, once you, what, you, what you'll see is that at the very top, we're using a lot of images. Uh, everything is a lot bigger. The fonts are a lot bigger, which makes things a lot uh, easier to read. Um, and you'll notice that um, the way we've organized the information, not a lot of scrolling, very clean, a lot of white space. Everything is broken up so you know exactly what you're clicking on. So you can go from general projects and each one has its own category to if you're looking for projects under our MMIP program, that information lives right below. 
This is an example of one of our district pages. This is actually um, our District 1 Northeast Georgia Regional Office. And just to outline this information, again, uh, the contact information in terms of the district engineer, their address, their phone number, right there at the top left. Uh, we do have a map to the district office that breaks down each of the area offices. Again, we're utilizing our branding colors and really making that information pop. And as we scroll down, we have an overview of all of our area offices. Again, we're providing general information, general contact information for each of our area offices. If somebody wants to contact an area office in their particular region, they can do that. It also provides a list of all the counties served in that particular area. So again, we want to make it easy for people to find information if they want to know who to contact or who represents their particular county that they live in. That information can, lives here and very easy to navigate. So here uh, we have provided a list of services and contacts, um, helpful resources, a list of key projects for each of the districts, as well as an entire list of all the counties served by that district. And what you'll see at the bottom is our trending section. And this is something that we've added to all of our district pages. This is a uh, Twitter feed, actually. Uh, and so again, this actually pulls from the regional account. So this is pulling from the D1 Twitter feed. So if somebody wants just D1 information, they can get that here. They can actually click on our social media hub. And if they want to follow that channel, they can go and, and to that particular section, look at all the channels that we have. But if they want to follow uh, D1 on Facebook, they can click on that information using our social media hub. And this is an overview of our contractors page. Uh, again, as you notice at the very top, uh, the way that you navigate through this section, very easy. We use a lot of visual components. Again, something that you can easily look at. You don't have to scroll. You're not doing a whole lot of reading. It's right there at the top, very easy to find. Um, and then we also, using Google Analytics, we also know what people are clicking on. Right, so what we did was we moved all the most frequently requested content up at the top. So here we have our directories, which we know a lot of people access. And then moving down, we organize this information based on very easy to understand terminology. So if you're looking for bidding and letting information, that section is right there in the middle. If you're looking for resources and forms and other information related to contractors, that information lives in that section. Uh, again, just made it a lot easier, a lot cleaner for people to navigate our site. We feel that um, the way that it's organized makes it easy for anybody, whether you are a contractor or a consultant or a general public, it really, we feel like this meets the needs of our stakeholders. So with that, um, I'm gonna open this up to questions. I just wanna point out before you submit any questions, um, this was a collaborative, effort between the Office of Communication, Strategic Communications and IT. And I've invited the members of the project team to join me today. They are, some of them I believe are here. And I'm gonna ask them to stand just so they can be recognized because again, this was a, a team effort. A lot of work went into this, a lot of research. And I just wanna make sure that they are acknowledged. Thank you. Are there any questions? Ms. Lemon? So did I hear you correctly when you said the district engineer's information is out there including their home addresses? Oh, no, not, not their home address. Okay. So, no, it's the, <laughs> it's the address of the district office. Okay. Um, and the main switchboard for the district. Okay. Yeah, that right. information is out there. But, yeah, none of their personal information is okay. their email addresses. Well, so we need to change that. Yeah. Actually, we took off, so on our website, we actually took off a lot of the email addresses. It points to our contact us form that I pointed out earlier. That's why we have that contact us button at the top of every page pretty much. So that way, if they have a question or comment, they can just click on that. I My home address is the funeral home, so anytime y'all want to come. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? 
Thank you. I think it's a very good job too, and I like the fact it does reflect the sophistication of the department better. I think that really is very clear. So, but thank you for your hard work. Thank you. Okay, with no other business, we are adjourned.